The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 21st chapter. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, you warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you all are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn but he will burn up the chaff with the unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John extorted the people and the people proclaimed the good news to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, grace to you and peace from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, it's Advent. It's the countdown to Christ. It's our time to wait in anticipation the coming of the newborn King, the time when we still, we still ourselves to read and listen to scriptures that foretell the coming of the Christ child, the time we are to prepare the way of the Lord. Now last week, John the Baptist and Santa Claus paid us a nice little visit in a very personal, unexpected, and entertaining way to remind us that Advent is upon us once again. They're not here again, are they? Never hurts to check. <laughs> Under the tree. Of course, last night as I was looking over here at the church, which I often do in the middle of the night, I saw this figure in front of the, the steps up here, and I thought, is somebody trying to break in? So I had to kind of come over and check it out. But no, it was the wise men are on their way. <laughs> Now, for some, Advent is used to remind them of how many shopping days are left before Christmas. For others, Advent triggers the beginning of a stressful time, worrying about how and when the family is going to get together, how the family is going to behave, stress over getting everybody's presents bought for. And still, for others, Advent is the time when Grief sets in. Grief over the loss of a loved one, the loss of a relationship, the loss of a job. Advent triggers many complex, confusing, contradictory, frustrating emotions. It can trigger guilt and pain of Christmases of past, and it can exacerbate anxiety over the Christmas that is to come. And yet, in the midst of all this, are those for whom Advent is really about the waiting 
and the anticipation of the birth of Jesus. And who are these people? How many people do you know that keep the meaning of Christmas and the advent and the anticipation clearly in front of them? How many of these folks read and meditate on prescribed scripture passages designed to enrich and heighten the advent journey? How many people could tell you why this whole waiting thing matters at all? After all, our world has managed to eliminate the need for waiting for anything. So let's review just a few things here. Now, how good are we at waiting? Well, let's see. Have you noticed that when you go out to eat, we have call-ahead seating? We don't want to wait for a table, do we? Did you know that uh, you can register online? If you go to the hospital, you can actually register online. And by the time you get to the hospital, if this is an emergency, you're already checked in and then call you right back. Now, when shopping at any store, have you noticed that they em employ people to manage the checkout lines? Now, how many times have we relished hearing those very romantic words there's no waiting on register three. <laughs> or I can help who's next. We have places like Jiffy Lube, Panda Express, Federal Express, American Express. We have the quick service lane at most auto dealership service departments. There's a take and bake pizza. Did they ever do the take and bake pizza? I think the idea behind that is for it to be quick. But think about it for a second. You drive to the store, you wait for them to make the pizza, and you drive home, and sometimes I think it'd be quicker if they just made it right there as you wait. We have convenience stores on every corner, it seems. And you know, that one is kind of interesting too, because by the time you pump your gas, get your drink, buy your lottery ticket, wait in line, and then pull into the heavy traffic, it really isn't all that convenient. We have 24-hour cleaners. Now, how many of you honestly have gotten up at 2 o'clock in the morning and said, hey, I'll go take my shirts to the cleaners? <laughs> and how about, how about instant photos? Do you remember the days of camera film? Does anybody remember film in camera? Yeah. We don't have to wait in a line for a movie because we have video on demand. The conveniences that we all want are right in front of us, at the click of a mouse or the click of a remote. Now, during Advent, we make a public and prophetic claim that waiting for, anticipating, and expecting Jesus' birth really does matter that the birth of Christ is not just the same old thing coming around each year, because each year we wait in anticipation for Jesus' birth because in the process of waiting emerges our opportunity for us to reflect on how we are living our lives today. Now, in our reading today, we see that John the Baptist, who was never one to be accused of having much tact, offers the crowd very direct and succinct ways to change how they are living their lives with his bombastic opening, you brood of vipers. John the Baptist is addressing not only the huge crowd gathered, but specifically challenges the tax collectors and soldiers to account for their behavior. What shall we do, they ask? Well, to the tax collectors who skim off the top and Fill their own pockets with others' hard-earned money, he says. Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. In other words, stop stealing from your neighbors. And to the soldiers, he says, not to push beyond the limits of the po power and the authority that they have been given. In other words, don't take advantage of simple citizens. Don't use fear, extortion, and making threats to get what you want. John reminds them that they are to do only the job that they have been given and to bear fruit worthy of repentance. 
In other words, do what is right and just and learn to be content with what doing that brings because doing what is right and just will bring them to a right relationship with others and most importantly, they will be in a right relationship with God. Share all that you have and stop doing all that other stuff. John calls them to repent and live out their lives in faithful service to their neighbor. So the question for us to reflect on as we wait is, well, then what should we do? How shall we respond to the advent of the Messiah? How can we meet the promise of the season with real, meaningful expectation? Now, lately, I've been thinking a lot about expectations. And when you think about it, so much of what we experience in life is really set up or kind of prefaced by our expectations. Now, with almost every fact of life, we operate under certain expectations. In our heads, we often determine what we think should happen even before it happens. And when that thing is supposed to happen, and it doesn't go exactly how we have pictured it in our mind's eye, we become disappointed. Now, some folks have no problem making their expectations known to others. Do you know people like that? Well, like, like Bob, like Bob's wife. Now, Bob forgot his wedding anniversary, poor soul. His wife was really upset. So she told him, Bob, tomorrow morning, I expect to find a gift in the driveway that goes from zero to 200 in six seconds, and it better be there. Well, the next morning, Bob got up early, and he left for work. When his wife woke up, she looked out the window, and sure enough, there was a box gift wrapped in the middle of the driveway. Now, confused, the wife put on her robe and ran out to the driveway, brought the box back in the house. She opened it and found a brand new bathroom scale. <coughs> Bob has been missing since Friday. So how often do we think that the other person or persons should just know what our expectations are? The reality is, is that we don't routinely clue others in on our expectations. And by not doing that, are we oftentimes setting ourselves up for disappointments? But it, is it realistic to tell everybody our every expectation? That would really make us sound kind of bossy and demanding and controlled. But isn't it normal to have a certain amount of expectation? After all, we can't live without goals, aspirations, and planning, something to look forward to. If we think about it, expectations also bring with it a sense of anticipation. And anticipation can bring excitement. But anticipating can be a tricky thing. Now, if you're like me, you like to be somewhat prepared for what lies ahead. Anticipating forces us to think about what our next move will be. We want to have enough information in order to make good decisions. Sometimes when we think we have prepared everything just perfectly, something unexpected happens and we are thrown off, messes us up. And when that happens, we feel very uncomfortable. And for some of us, that means feeling embarrassed and incompetent. And if you were like me, you hate being caught with your pants down. Well, the good news is that, try as we may, we can never know exactly what the future holds. And what's more, I don't think that we are meant to know exactly what lies ahead. I wonder if that element of the unknown is our cue to stop for a moment and reflect on where it is we are coming from to remember what has been so that we can better savor that which is to come. The world of the unknown is also one of the strongest, if not the single most entity that causes us terrible anxiety. Fear of the unknown causes us humans the most difficulty, I think, of all the mental afflictions. That guilt for things 
have happened in the past, and that could be very paralyzing too. That is why we have Advent. Advent is God's way of giving us the time to think and reflect on what has been in order to be able to celebrate that which is to come, which is the birth of the Savior of the world. Advent is our time to slow down. Now, each Advent that we experience is our opportunity to, and as John the Baptist says, cut every tree down that bears no good fruit and throw it into the fire. Advent is a time to cut off that which is within us that does not bear good fruit. Advent is the time for us to relish in the knowledge that through the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has claimed our past, God has claimed our present, and God has claimed our future. And that, my friends, I think is worth waiting for. Amen.